Hi, my name is Saskia and I am a recent history of art graduate, now working at the Royal Academy. And hi, I'm Georgie. Um, I joined Juice Ramp and Sons in October last year. Um, so I've just finished my foundation year at Camberwell and I'm starting at Central St. Martins doing performance design and practice in September. Um, so I guess Rory will start our conversation talking about a little bit your kind of career journey. Um, so first of all, can you tell us about how you got into the arts generally? Oh, yeah, um, well, thanks very much for inviting me and it's lovely to be here. Oh, how I got into the arts. Well, I think um, the, for me, I, I, uh, I've just, I've, I've, I'm not actually I'm not such a talker um, in a way, although a lot of my work is about is using the voice. I've always not been uh, like speaking hasn't been natural to me. So I think I from a very young age, I gravitated much more to kind of um, make like making music or like just um, pl plonking on a on a, or plonking on a on a piano and um and drawing and I think for, for me when I uh it's just it's just been a very big part of my life and I actually had an incredible I was really lucky to have a very, an incredible art teacher at school who um I don't think if it wasn't for her I'd, I, I don't know really if I'd be doing this but she she let us she had an uh she always let the art room be open at school so any lunchtime, you could just come, and that's where I spent every uh, lunchtime um, as a, as a bit of a refuge in a way. It was where, and I think, yeah, teachers are very important, and because of particularly her, uh, Miss Jeffcott, that um, it, it gave me the confidence to study art or that. Or, or just the space to kind of develop my own world through art. So um, when I came to leaving school, I had this sort of a bit um, dilemma, do I do music or art? And in the end, I did art. Yeah, I definitely relate to that kind of art room safe haven thing. Um, I think a lot of creative def de creatives definitely can. Um, Okay then, so you studied in London and then Amsterdam, right? So what were the kind of differences, I guess, um, in kind of that shift um, in place, would you say? Yeah. So I, I, I studied at Chelsea College of Art um, for three years. Uh, that's where I did my BA. And, um, ooh, well, I mean, firstly, you're you're part of it's their their like I think there was nearly a hundred people in my year, so there was maybe three hundred on fine art, and um, I would say in the UK it's very unstructured. Um, there were no workshops or no like, like I arrived and you just you expected to make work, and. Um, that's the sort of structure of it. You might have, you have a group crit, you're part of a crit group and you have lectures, but it's very unstructured in the sense of like, you're not given an ass any assignments, you're there to develop your practice. And after studying at Chelsea, I, I did a, what's called a, po like a post academic residency. So it was, it was a, a studio program called De Ateliers where um, you get your you get given a studio for two years, and they select eight people a year. So from going from a hundred, it was like a hundred to eight. Um, and where and whereas I might have had uh, maybe three or four tutorials in a term, I then every Tuesday visiting artists, curators, and people in the arts came and saw us every Tuesday. So within one week already, I may have had five or six conversations. So it got me, uh, it, it gave me a huge 
practice to be able to speak about my work um, and the kind of work I'm a very unmaterial person so often people would walk into my studio and just be confronted with a piano and a desk and the only way to access my work was just to talk to me um, so that was quite a big difference but uh, now that I've been in the Netherlands uh, nearly 12 years and split my time between the two I teach quite a lot in uh, on various BA courses and MA and in there there's a lot more workshop and collaborative making which goes on in fine art so that, that's probably the two main differences. Yeah that's really interesting I guess you know now kind of I'm going into that system of you know studying I guess UAL as well um yeah it's, it's interesting to talk about um how that yeah the kind of change and shifts and focus um you know which is better and whatever so yeah you talked a little about a bit about how your work um again is kind of materializes in so many different forms um so you do use like a, such a wide range of media um including you know music film text drawing Live performance, I mean, it seems pretty endless. Um, why do you do this? Like, you know, why do you feel the need to kind of um, expand over so many mediums, I guess? Well, I think um, maybe I'll bring in some images. Um, yeah. But if I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so, can you? Yeah. Is that, is that there? Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I mean, when I got to uh, art, art school, as I said, I had a bit this di dilemma about studying music or fine arts. And um, so here's a bit my, this, uh, I can return to this image, but um, this is a bit like my identity pizza um, of the things who, uh, the things which make me who I am. And I suppose they inform what I do um, and I mean that these different elements come into the work in different ways. So, um, I mean, on the top, top, on the top corner, you see a church. My dad's act, actually an Anglican vicar. So I grew up in um, various uh, Anglican churches. Well, I think my dad was maybe, a, a vicar of maybe four different churches by the time I left home but it meant that I always kind of grew up in a sort of semi-public house where um, the phone was always ringing um, and we my, my brothers and sisters kind of learned to answer the phone not for ourselves but kind of for the church so people or what it means to be part or not feel a part of a community has been part of my life. So when I started, I realised that people were very important to me in, and I wanted my, my work to kind of think about who I am making for, who, who needs it when you make it, when you make something, who is actually uh, going to view it or can you make something for someone else? Um, and then I music was just always a big part of my life I was also in cathedral choirs so did this very kind of British like uh singing every day before school um for an hour I think we did seven church church services a week as well and then I was in pop bands so I had bit, bit this mixture of both classical and pop music and then yeah those things have all kind of come together and um I love drawing um, and that's that kind of um, is always part of what I do and yeah so um, I, I suppose it's how when you it's how to bring different elements of ourselves into our work and they naturally do. Yeah that's really interesting um, I really feel that it kind of makes so much sense in kind of your background and all feeds in really nicely. Um, so yeah, your work kind of explores elements of activism, 
how we form community and strive for social change and these some of the reasons why we really really wanted to talk to you um so I just wanted to ask kind of what draws you towards these themes specifically oh well, I think I mean also when I was at art school I realized I was quite angry uh about just not well I mean when you care about something or when you've experienced um realizing that art can be that place to channel the things that we care about things that we just care about as people that we're trying to understand of what we've experienced and I suppose I would say I've always uh been quite like um I, when I left um when I kind of made a transition from the church or my dad's church it was during the time of the Iraq war and I um I decided to go to the Quakers um and Quakerism has always been a, an important part of my life which for me is like an intersection between spirituality and social peace and justice issues so that's just one thing which also just is a which grounds me as a person and I feel that over the ever since studying like finding out about kind of feminist art practices and kind of thing uh, art practices which are rooted in from a civil rights movement gaining a kind of understanding that art could be a vehicle for social change I've kind of learned from them as guiding stars um kind of gradually being able to put that into hopefully practice myself um but yeah I, I think it just art provides that space in a different way to think about how we it, yeah art is about expression it's about communication um and and when we care about something of course it's going to be a a vessel to do so Brilliant, thank you. Um, so now just moving on to some of your specific projects, could you tell us a little bit about The Undercurrent? Yeah, um, so I've got some images as well. Um, so yeah, I, um, two years ago, I started working on a body of work, which for me, I felt just had to be rooted in the climate crisis. Um, when I was a teenager, I've been part of um, kind of environmentalist concern actions. But um, I think when I was maybe, yeah, in my early 20s, so around two, from 2005 to 2008, it was when uh, I think just before the financial crash, um, but we saw these transitions from a Labour to a Conservative government and austerity. And a lot of the protests and like the 2011 riots, they were um, responding to uh, things which were rooted in those changes. It, they also were motivated from specific events. But um, I suppose as, as a series of protests or things happening among young people, my, my own generation, it wasn't so centered on climate. And to see the Friday for Future movement and a whole new wave of climate activism coming from um, a younger generation, it made me really question why my own generation weren't so urgent or that why that wasn't at such a forefront and I just felt that any um, platform that I had I had to make that also uh, a, I had to give that a place so um, I was invited to do a residency in Boise Idaho and um, I don't know if you know where Idaho is but it's in the north uh, it's one of the northern states it's a bit like a, a pan like a cooking pan and the very thin top uh, borders with Canada. But um, as a state, uh, the main city is the most isolated in the US. So it's quite a unique um, city where I was invited to do this residency in a place called Ming Studio. 
and um, yeah, I, so this was the first opportunity where I, I thought I'd put the climate crisis centre stage and I made an open call to work with young people from the age of 14 to 21 to be part of the film. And so I framed it as a way, as yeah, in how how can we relate climate crisis of the climate change intersectionally to experiences of home, shelter, loss, adaption, and transition? And um, after this open call, I had twelve um, young people respond, and it it a lot. Uh, I was at in the very centre in. Um, but who's sort of at the back, quite tall with um, a, a beautiful sort of headpiece. Um, that's Liam. And Liam had organised some of the main climate strikes in Boise. And through net, their network, they put things on social media, this open call. And we were able to generate quite a lot of responses. I think actually 25 people responded. But in the end, this was the group who could work in that particular way kind of time frame. Some people were going on holiday or the dates didn't match up. But um, what I was really happy with was that uh, not all the young people knew each other. Two came, uh, th uh, four came from outside smaller towns to on uh, quite a rural community. Um, and it meant that, that, yeah, it was a completely new collection of group rather than just a friendship group. And we worked over the space of um, a month doing um, workshops, film shoots, individual dialogues, just talking about how uh, the climate crisis related to our lives, how we begin to talk about it, how we find words to acquaint it to, like what does it mean to be a guardian or take care of something, to take care of your home, to think through it through like a friendship. Um, so these are some of the workshops. And then after doing workshops and we also devised kind of choreography and movement work. Um, we then, uh, I also was working with a homeless shelter as well. So um, alongside the young people, I also started to volunteer in a interfaith uh, homeless shelter because I wanted to work also with those who were experiencing ho homelessness as a as a, to kind of um, yeah those who were very viscerally experiencing what it meant to lose a home so they play a smaller role in the film but an important one and I've continued working with them the last year but yeah with the young people they I asked them each to uh, yeah, to if if they were happy um, filming in a location which was important to them, and we uh, filmed a series of dialogues in the workshops. It was very important to also involve the camera. So we talked about why, what does it mean to film something, record something, be filmed. Um, yeah, and then I also worked with a brilliant singer who I found on SoundCloud called Declan Rowe John who was 13 at the time, she's now 15. And um, I had already co-written some songs with a singer called Robin Haddon. And then I worked with those songs with Declan and she sort of made them her own and added lyrics. And um, as the film develops, some, an old, older voice comes in as um, a guy called Jerry, who had run the state governor, who had been very politically involved in his life. And he comes to talk about his experience or his feelings on the climate crisis and from an older perspective. And yeah, the film is structured by a series of music videos which interweave. Um, and as it, as it builds, they end up in this quite vast landscape called Craters of the Moon, in which we explored how to put a voice in a landscape. Um, and we use these sort of activist uh, technique uh, practices like human microphones hear them uh, they were shouting phrases which were important to them and I think this moment they're saying how far can a voice carry and it yeah as it builds the final scene is quite dramatic on this top of this old volcano in which they're shouting uh, chants uh, a chant which we kind of developed through the workshop and yeah so that's the undercurrent
Thank you for such a great description. So now we're going to spend about eight minutes watching an excerpt of the undercurrent. There should be a link going up in the chat now. Um, so please take the time to watch it and we will be coming back at 5.40. Dwaynika says the song was so beautiful. I agree, it really is very, very enchanting almost. And Susie says, this is a question, Rory. Do you get nervous approaching or working with new people? I th yeah, I think always there's this, um, there's always this kind of a, a, a shyness um, and um, wanting to uh, approach someone in the best possible way, like be clear as well in what you're trying to communicate. Like, do you, how much do you, you don't want to also overload someone with someone, something? So it's, it is a matter of like think, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of it is finding the best possible approach, like, um, and, and, and finding out, like, yeah, giving enough, but not too much. So people, so someone can also respond to it in their own way. Um, so I, I think when I, in the, in the process of, of kind of trying to reach or approaching people or meeting new people. I'm very, um, I, I do feel quite nervous or quite um, like, uh, like want, wanting, wanting it to go well, a bit like a first date or a, <laughs> I don't know, something like that. Um, I just wanted to ask after watching, um, kind of related to what you've just said, is that obviously the young people, like you said, were involved in quite a lot of the process. And I was just wondering, were they also involved in the choreography in that excerpt, them going around the singer? Yeah, so when, um, as part of a, a workshop, I, um, I kind of introduced quite a few choreographic exercises. Like the first, the first one we did was actually creating a, a little stream around a room um and kind of thinking of ourselves like clouds and um kind of uh, giving a word and then kind of try imagining like that we were raining uh words or kind of cloud bubbles of ideas and when we did little activities like um uh find it, like finding one another um uh, in a space and kind of also creating currents so in the end, uh, that kind of choreography of running through the house kind of came from kind of working a bit together uh, about like how to create a current. Um, so so wow. yeah, yeah they're, they're, they were sort of, uh, it sort of stems from maybe choreographic activities, which I introduced. I see. Wow, yeah, that's great. And um so thinking more about the music side of the, the film, does the idea of sensation feature in the undercurrent in regards to the relationship between the sound and the visual? Yeah, I think... Um, and whatever, whatever sensation means to you as well. Yeah, I'm thinking of the word sensational. <laughs> and I mean, like, sensation... Um, I mean, when I think of the word sensation, I think of little vibrancies and that it, all those vibrancies add up to a kind of um, And I think maybe uh, when I, when I, because when I was, I mean, I love things to be quite cinematic myself. So when I, I, I'm, I'm filming, I'm filming quite a lot like things uh I worked with a small film crew who did like the music videos but like more of a one-on-one -on -one is I did that like through the car wash 
but I'm I'm interested in where our kind of more mundane or everyday experiences kind of become more sensational that they are just as evocative and when we think of like just things which are we might think of just as quite mundane in our lives but um how what happens when we we frame that in a certain way and I think the undercurrent I also see as being a bit like something very ITB about it like it's something uh like something which could be like uh, four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon on ITV and I wanted it to feel quite accessible um, but it it had the potential to be quite yeah just um, kind of emo emotionally moving um, so yeah uh, so I kind of went for it with that sort of sound and feel because it is it, it's, it's, it's a very emotional issue how can we not be very emotional about the destruction of um, our home. Mm, I completely agree. And kind of stemming from that, do you consider yourself an activist and your work as a form of activism? Uh, yeah, I mean, I hope, I think of the word activism in relation to agency. And I, I'm very lucky to have the platforms that I'm given and if, and with any, uh, space that I am, am, am afforded how I can share that or use it in a way in which I can listen to others and then use my skills as an artist to um, to do something with that um, so in that sense I, yeah I, 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 I see it on the lines of activism and I'm interested in how activism can take many different forms and languages away from what might we might expect from activism so how to think through it through the lens of beauty or joy or um I mean disco is a form of activism you know all of all of these different forms in which like the, the multiplicity of how we are able to express ourselves um and how we can channel different kind of languages or our tools to do that like maybe we associate activism within a certain way of operating but I think uh, like through different uh, movements we see how it how it um, takes many different forms thank you yeah um I guess even just like coming off from that um I don't know like everything you're kind of talking about is kind of like I guess channeling all these kind of multifarious kind of manifestations of each kind of um, you know each kind of medium and all the kind of activism all the meanings I feel like it's shown really well in um, Software Garden um, your work which kind of materialize as an exhibition um, a set of music videos a live concert um, so I guess going on to Software Garden, can you tell us a little bit about it? And did you always intend for your work to kind of um, reside in these mediums or did you kind of have an aim to have like one outcome and then they just kind of happen naturally or how did that work? Um, well, I, so like when I went to art school, also I, I, did, I didn't really make anything material for the whole three years. And I think coming with a background in music even though I love drawing when I got there I was thinking much more about like uh yeah when you're a, a musician it's very direct you stand up in front of an audience and you perform and I found it really confusing suddenly to think oh I've made this and that's gonna express it for me rather than like that direct audience you thing which takes place and um yeah, it's a mute. And after playing also in pop bands, I was, I kind of was think I always had a bit of a, a kind of desire to think how I personally would approach a pop, like an, a music album. 
and that a music album could bring together many different things which I kind of also gravitated towards like the fact like it's a very it, a music album never unless you produce all of it yourself it involves lots of people um and that there are music videos so it has a very strong visual element and also a um a concert so and it's also meant to be uh a, a pop album usually tours so it's never just this like one-off thing and I was very tired of doing these one-off performances it was very too easy just to do something and then like walk away from it and not repeat it um so I was particularly attracted to the like pop album as like a form and um I've got a few more images which I can share which maybe helps um so yeah I started working on um a pop album in 2016 and at the heart of that uh, or the kind of what generated it was working with this amazing woman called Carol R. Calland who is a poet and she was part of another project uh, I did and from that group I knew that I, I really wanted to create a dialogue specifically with her and what I found particularly fascinating about Carol is that she um, she loved technology, but had never owned a computer herself. So she knew all the words like she taught me the word motherboard. She knew about various algorithm sequences and had read a huge amount of sci fi. You can see also Doctor Who behind her as a calendar. Um, and I asked her if she would if she would like to join me on this journey of creating a music album in which she could maybe uh, be the narrator of. And during that time, Carol was experiencing changes from her disability living allowance and that changing to the PIP, the personal independent payments. And she was undergoing this quite well, very stressful testing which took place and and if and this sort of fear if you answer one question differently you might lose certain access to care facilities and so she started to write about how she would much ref, pref, more prefer a robotic form of care um, and she also then after about like uh, a, a month of talking she came back with this poem called software garden and, and so she named, she came up with that name. And in this poem, she kind of started to question of what it would be to bring people together uh, and program a bit of a new world order. And from Software Garden, it grew uh, from her poems into a 11 track music video album. Um, and these are some stills. And during Software Garden, uh, it starts off with the th three main people, let's say, uh, Carol, Cassie, a choreographer and performer from Denmark, and singer Robin Haddon. And as Software Garden grows, more and more people from different backgrounds enter it, uh, younger people, older people. Um, and that, uh, yeah, the album, these are sort of the credits of people involved. And it has also got its sort of own album artwork. I've been working with a, a poster maker from Sheffield who paints these all by hand, David Andrews. And these are some of the posters in, uh, involved with lyrics. Um, this is a drawing, my, one of my own drawings of Carol and um, Pepper, the robot, who features also in Software Garden, who's at the sort of forefront of thinking about at what extent can uh, a, a robot respond to emotional cues by a human being. Uh, another poster by David. And as when it's toured as an exhibition, uh, there's a lot of plastic bags. Uh, they kind of recur through it as these sort of things which drop from above. And throughout Software Garden, there is this sort of recurring imagery of people floating or carrying one another. 
And for me, the plastic bag is this very kind of problematic object or technological object, which is meant to relieve the burden of uh, weight and sort of take care from our 10 minute walk back from Tesco, but we're left with it sort of this membrane, which uh, shouldn't be there. Uh, his one filled with moss, which sort of sweats during the exhibition. And these have song titles on. So this is the song Government Lover. And the central refrain of Government Lover is, can a government be my lover, a non-abusive lover? Can a government be my lover, a fucking tender lover? So excuse my language. Um, and here's one version. Um, this is a more intimate version of, of the gallery I work with in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's take, this is from the live concert. So as that's toured, um, we've, each time we've uh, give, made an open call for people to come together for a, a few days to make choreography and work with Cassie, the dancer. And uh, so each time the choreography has changed through the concerts, this is one in Berlin. And Carol has narrated the whole thing from her living room in Sheffield. So this was before the pandemic. So we felt quite ahead of the curve when uh, when everything started going online, but we had already been doing online crossovers. So this is Carol, yeah, doing, narrating the thing from her living room to an audience. And this is one in uh, Stadelik Museum, which we also had a choir accompany. There you see the singer Robin Haddon in the back. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's Software Garden. Amazing. Um, so now we've got a um, little four minute extract from one of the Software Garden music videos. Um, so we'll give you five minutes to go and have a little look at that. So we'll come back at nine minutes to ish, eight minutes to six ish. Um, you'll hear my voice when we're supposed to come back anyway. So yeah, if we do the same like we did before, all go away, click the link in the chat to have a look at one of the software garden extracts. Okay, see you guys in five minutes. Okay. Um, Hopefully everyone's back now. Um, yeah, that was really beautiful. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, Rory, again, a little bit more about um, the sound and music in your work. Like, obviously you've talked about how so essential they are um, kind of in terms of your work. Um, but I just wondered, do you have any particular influences at all? Oh, uh yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I love, yeah, I love music. I, uh, I have my like favorite of like, um, I like, I mean, if I'm from the '90s, so like, I think my first CD I ever got was Barbie Girl by Aqua. And I, and I won a school dance competition <laughs> to that. So um, from Aqua to um, to like, I mean, uh, Björk, Björk is a, I love Björk. I love the, the, the first Sugar Babes album was a very important album to me. And it's like the 20 year anniversary. Oh, yeah. Um, but like, uh, yeah, a lot of, um, I'm actually, I realize more and more how my like choral background has also has come into it. And, um, and then just like elec electronica, and um, like, uh, I mean, at the moment, these last two years, I've listened to a lot of Serpent with Feet and, and some of their orchestral, right? Like the, the Blisters LP is just stunning. Um, so I, I suppose I, I do listen to this kind of bit intersection between like uh, kind of classical and, um, and pop. Uh, and I suppose Software Garden, it, it kind of builds from that first song into kind of a rather eclectic mixture of things like there's sort of my version of kind of uh, 
of beats and a bit more poppy kind of vibe which then takes place um but yeah i but i i, but I love i love arranging music i think that's one of my favorite things it's just but how you can create so many different arrangements to a song like yeah cool okay so now moving on to the studio section of this conversation um we know that your sketchbook is really important to you as i guess as much as your physical space um can you explain why and show us some examples i think you have to make some photos of your physical studio in holland as well yeah um so I kind of lead a bit of a dual life between Holland and UK and um, I also have a little studio space in the UK for when I'm working there but I don't have any images of that but since um, since July last year I've been living in a quite remote village in the very north of the Netherlands called A and um, in the garden I have a little studio space where I um, have a big, big table. Um, and this is a bit from when I was been editing uh, this sort of ecosystem for this exhibition, which opened last week. Um, and in that I have kind of just some things on the table, like to-do lists or ticking off all the screens. I think at that point I'd only done five. Um, but as someone who, traveled a lot well previously a lot and but it roots all the way back from being at school and my art teacher encouraged uh me to have a sketchbook so I've been making having these sketchbooks since I was 11 or 12 and for me it's a place which is most constant in bringing together all that I'm working on so um, whether that be phrases or things this is um, a, um, uh, one from last year this is something someone's said in a workshop about where they connect and I just thought it was very I kind of also sort of related to it so I thought I had to uh, I put it in a sketchbook um, song song lyrics um, are there, and it's, I suppose it's a place to sort of map out ideas, even performances. I like to have lots, I like to, when the projects get bigger and bigger, sometimes I need to simplify them and just hold on to key anchors or images. So this is a, actually a performance, oh, I relate this to a performance I did in 2012 when I was invited to choreograph a reopening of a, um, the Stalic Museum, which is a bit like the equivalent of Tate in the Netherlands and um, the best way I could kind of work through that performance was thinking about uh, that the young the people I was working with were like fires kind of giving off signals to this audience which was like a vast ocean so uh, and then this is some some um, from the time I was working with the under at the undercurrent and thinking about just what the home was and like thinking of it as if the a screen could expel a kind of a feeling and in a way from this is before I even went to America but um I feel like going through the car wash in a way uh made that happen um and that happened purely by accident like Ari was just like oh my car's really dirty so I said oh <laughs> should we just film getting it cleaned and that's how that happened um and then just a way to also just process things very directly is kind of to kind of navigate. So this one says, like, to feel resourceless, to feel resourcelessness. This may be like kind of and when a word becomes an anchor. I think on the, it says, don't forget how in the US, how much of a taboo, taboo the word climate change, the words climate change were. Um, and yeah, and this has made me a more, I'm in the new work that I'm slowly starting to make is, is looking at more at the intersection between the criminal justice system and environmental law and how those two things connect um, through people's experience of incarceration. Um, yeah, so yeah, and these are some more recent sketchbooks, I think, uh, 
this is a pro for, courage is a very important word that um, has come through working with a group. Um, uh, someone I've been working with just ex explained how the word, how important the word courage was to kind of as their oar to navigate uh, what keeps them afloat. Um, so, and, uh, I mean, so I, I love I love words. So I'm always trying to think through words. Um, and then other things are much more abstract. I've been drawing a lot of purses these last two years. So an extension of the of the plastic bag is thinking about the purse and like various instances where people are either finding purses or stealing purses or reclaiming purses. Um, uh, thinking a lot about screens as kind of portals this one someone says they're like so kind of um trying to find a tv it's someone says i love tv on their sweatshirt so it, it's quite a i think i mean this is a more recent one where i've been working with a, a researcher in permaculture where we were trying to think how how a digital archive could be a permaculture permaculture so yeah this is a bit my sketchbooks but I've got maybe I think I've I've got over uh, fifty in total, and some sometimes it's just even like um, when I'm watching films, uh, taking screen screen grabs of them, and like here was a, an Armenian film I watched, and just trying to think through it. Um, so yeah, that's. Do, do, Saskia and Georgie, do you have any sketchbooks or notebooks? I have, um, I have mine here in preparation for the um, for the activity that we're about to do. Um, but it's definitely not as you know detailed as yours. I mean, like at the beginning of the year, my New Year's resolution was to try and do something inside of it every day, but. I've kind of failed that now I think this is one of the first ones I did I was feeling really upset because like I was having a tough time getting a job um and then I was also like playing around with gradients and you know trying to find like something that was really calming um and just kind of yeah having a little play around like studying my own face those yeah. kind of things um but yeah it's not about me this studio visit so <laughs> Um, should we crack on with the activity then? Um, so I would like everyone to grab their notebooks and pen and pencil if you have it. Um, we're going to start doing the drawing activity of this session, which is going to be a 10 minute, um, I guess kind of response to your surroundings. So it can either be the direct surroundings that you're in, or it can be somewhere that you would like to be. So something a bit more fantastical. Um, Georgie and I will be asking Rory questions during the activity. So if you have any more questions, please pop them in the chat. And also, um, if you would like, you could also put a description of what you're drawing and why in the chat as well, um, if you feel comfortable, of course. Yeah, look at my kind of sketchbook. I'm such a bad one for just like, I'll start one and then I'll start another one and then I'll buy another one because I don't think I have one. And then I just have way too many. And they're just like a mixture of like shopping lists, but then like drawing pages and just a mess. But <laughs> it makes sense in my brain. <laughs> yeah, and like during the lockdown, I was obviously couldn't go anywhere. So I went out into my own garden and was thinking, what kind of flowers can I, can I draw? So I started trying to sketch them from like really like different angles. Um, that was quite fun, but it's crazy what the mind thinks up when you're in isolation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think the sketchbook becomes this cosmos in a way to like just navigate. Oh, it's like a compass as well. Mm. To, uh, orientate ourselves or um, create a map of where we are. Right. 
I do um, love it as well because I'm quite a forgetful person so it's just having that kind of physical manifestation to kind of gather your thoughts and have every like that trail there mm -hmm. um yeah it's interesting well, I, I sometimes feel like it's also it's a bit like the progression of a computer game you know like certain things reoccur or maybe there are yeah. certain um, images or things but it's sort of it's it's a bit like this game or journey where we're trying to yeah work through what we're experiencing so we have a question in the chat um from Rivka she says or he so, so she sorry she they I really like your film Undercurrent so cinematic did you apply for the residency in Idaho or did they approach you also are you still in contact with the people in the film uh, yeah, um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I also love things to be very cinematic. I think, I think um, maybe also my, my leaning to cinem the cinematic is maybe there's an assumption that a certain kind of activism or things to do with social justice are quite, uh, uh, there's a, they're framed through a certain rawness which is is incredibly powerful import and important but um sometimes I think the cinematic I'm interested in, in how that also provides the space to dream and I think that's a very um yeah sometimes I just know that's how I operate I always need a space which however difficult things are that they still provide a space to dream and um, yeah, the residency, they, yeah, they approached me actually about four years before I went. And um, it, it, it took quite a lot of time to finally get to Idaho and make, make a time in my schedule for it to make, to be possible. And it, it kind of aligned with this, this commission to make the undercurrent for this this prize I was nominated for and um yeah I uh, I'm I'm still in contact with the people from the film in various like ways so every time the film has traveled as as an exhibition I've also done a series of dialogues with those in the film and maybe and a new group where where we've done a workshop exploring uh, and climate change and to try to create a dialogue. So actually on the 6th of June, hopefully three of the, the, three of the group from Idaho will join um, with a group from the Isle of Skye in Scotland. So, and then Liam, Liam just made a letter and contribution as part of a mail art commission connected to um, the undercurrent being shown in Vienna. So yeah, it's kind of through these uh, things that I'm able to stay in touch. And then just from social media, I get an insight into people's lives and what, what, what if they've moved or if they've gone to college. Um, so it's a bit like this sort of thing. Thank you. And we have a few questions to ask, a uh, separate question to ask as well. Um, so, one I was really interested in is what is the reason behind your Instagram name, Rainbows of Gorse? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I think I my Tumblr back in 2011 was Rainbows of Gorse. And um, Gorse is my favourite bush slash flower. Um, and I actually have a gorse, little gorse bush growing in my garden. And I just love how, yeah, the gorse bush in the winter, like they come into flower in February and you get this really amazing bright yellow. And I, I just love yellow plants. Um, and then rainbows just because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of that persuasion. <laughs> and, um, and I also thought it was quite, it sounds, it sounds like rainbows, of course, but it's rainbows, of course. And, and I think I think I must have got logged onto Instagram in 2013, and I just did it. And then I've I've kind of I kind of uh, 
never changed it so it's just like it's a bit like it's a bit like your first email address yeah um and I've just kept it as my handle and I I kind of um yeah I kind of prefer it than having my name on. yeah I think it's great I mean I must admit that I did first google Rory Pilgrim Instagram when we were researching you and I was very surprised when I didn't see your name as your your handle but I think it's a lot more interesting when you have something else because there's so much backstory that you know you don't know until you ask um so thank you for sharing that there are there are actually two Rory Pilgrims in Australia um and I've actually <laughs> I have a, a very dear friend who's in who's just turned 80 and I noticed and she joined Instagram and she started messaging a 15 year old Rory Pilgrim who she it's a it's a a 15 year old teenage girl in uh, in Adelaide and my friend Laureen started like commenting under her posts so um uh yeah <laughs> just a note to everyone who's drawing we have about five minutes until you finish okay and another question um, as an artist who works collaboratively, how has the lockdown and isolation affected your pra your well, your practice and your projects? Oh well, um, a lot of it has been online. So I, I was I was I've been working with Serpentine Gallery for nearly two years, and this uh, this commission was going to be a, a performance commission like a live broadcast all in September last year and we had just started workshops I think we'd done four IRL like in person and then it happened and yeah we we quickly realized that it needed to go online but it it was um like everyone we were figuring all that out but I suppose the, the difficult question was what what is safe space for people like is that do people have homes that they can speak and feel comfortable I was working with a group where um like part of the reason they came was it it, it got them out like it was an opportunity to leave their house and be with others so it was kind of negotiating how do we create a space which feels comfortable for people and and uh develop a workshop methodology and think about what what works what doesn't how like zoom time is very different to real t like in-person time um so i've i've done nearly a year and a half of all online workshops and i suppose one big effect was uh realizing and it's it was the same with like the undercurrent all these projects i like to work with in a group but also very one-on-one -on -one. And when you do workshops online, you don't have that like space when people are coming in or arriving just to have like a small, maybe it's even one minute, but you just ask them how they are, how they're doing in a coffee break. And that becomes really difficult in this space. So um, with my colleagues, Amal and Lizzie, we, we also, it was very important to phone people in between, like, so that we do two workshops every two weeks and in between we would do individual, like just on the phone. Um, and it, it gave me, the last year, I, it, I wrote a lot of new, I wrote 10 new songs. So it gave me space just to concentrate on music. Um, but it's been hard doing music as 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 kind of collaboratively as I was doing with especially Robin, the singer I work with. But we've we've also done like online songwriting sessions. Um, so yeah, this has been the main effect. Cool. I have one more question, I think, in this section. Um, so I've just been getting on doing the drawing activity because I really wanted to do it. Um, but I wanted to know, what would your dream studio space be? Like, where in the world would it be? Um, you know, would it be big? Would it be small? Like, kind of also taking into consideration, like, all the different stuff you do. Um, yeah, what would it look like? Oh, that's a difficult question. I think, well, I just, I, it's like, as long as I've got a space with a door that I can close, um, 
I'm, I'm quite protective of my, like I, I, I'm very passionate that everyone should have a space of their own. Um, and that, that's like a fundamental <laughs> human right that everyone should have a space of their own and um, where they can close the door, where they feel warm, um, where they have a desk, where they can sit comfortably. So as long as I've got that and my sketchbook and something, a tool to make music in, I think they're like the core things. I, I, it's space and time and warmth. They're like the, as long as I've got them, I'm okay. I can work. Um, and I, a bit like basic living income. I feel that's, that's, that's a, it's just a fundamental right for everyone. Um, so yeah, that that would it's it, maybe I mean a, a, maybe natural light as well uh, is good, but a good desk, a good desk. Brilliant. Um, okay, so hopefully everyone should be done with the drawing activity now, um, and I'd quite like you guys to like I quite like to ask you guys um, if you're comfortable sharing to just hold your sketchbook up to the screen so we could like see everyone's. I'll do mine as well. Cool. Mine is quite basic, but I just, it's just next to me. And I think it just, so it's like a stick on whiteboard that you put on. It's not even a real, it's literally you roll it out and you stick it onto your wall and a chair and then a printer. And I thought it quite well demonstrated my surroundings because there's three people in my house at the moment working from home. Um, yeah. Cool. Everyone's looks really cool. So I did kind of amalgamation of both concepts. So that's what I'm looking at right now. It's my computer stacked up on like a load of um, recipe books and magazines and stuff. So I've got that height. And then in the background is like trees and a lake. Because earlier me and my dad were talking about trying to get to Italy sometime this year. So I've definitely got like rural Italy on the mind. So it's kind of both of them combined in a way. <laughs> nice. I saw, I can't remember who it was, but oh, Ben, I, that's a very, looks like a very cool drawing from what I can see. And Dwayneika, I saw you actually colored yours in. So <laughs> well done for fitting that in the 10 minutes. Okay, so. I think we'll ask, there's one last question in the chat and then we'll say thank you to Rory. Um, so lastly, what's the most important thing in your studio right now? Um, oh. Well, I think my, if, if, if the house was on fire, I would just run for my sketchbooks like they're the most important thing just on a personal level um so probably that and uh i mean i've i've, I've been really enjoying making oil paintings so uh, just after um i think yeah it's it's as a space for myself it's also a space to 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 dream i mean I, I'm, all, I'm always a bit like not embarrassed of my drawings and paintings. I feel very slightly, they, uh, I kind of like the fact, the fact that they, they kind of create, they're a bit like this, um, they set this slightly strange tone or they're a bit like a strange to the planet orbiting what I do, <laughs> which I sometimes feel, and I kind of question my own slightly amateur skills, but, um, but I, I just being able to work with color or like the richness in which oils things do. And I think no matter what, if you're working on a, a film or whatever, just finding the ways to think through something or communicate something with ourselves. I know that I, I appreciate having those different toolboxes. It's a bit like makeup as well. If you want to try a new shade or like this year, my color, I, uh, my colour for this year has been this kind of mustard um, and yeah it gives all these things these things in the world give us give us 
confidence they give us uh they empower us um so yeah to have to have tools gives us agency to just be in the world well thank you so much for your insight and all of your answers today we've really enjoyed having you oh thank you for thank you for um inviting me it's been lovely to meet you all <laughs>